Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, another attack on Gaza. Journalists reporting from the battlefield trying not to be among the casualties. Journalists and the courts, legal cases in Greece, in the UK, and Pakistan, where it's a case of murder. We take a long look at the state of journalism in India with Tarun Tejpal of Tehelka. And we are here to help the world. Reversing the flow of African relief in our web video of the week. In many respects, this latest Israeli assault on Gaza does look like a case of history repeating itself. There are plenty of recurring storylines, each side accusing the other of starting it, the fact that once again there is an election coming up in Israel, and the hugely disproportionate number of casualties on the Palestinian side. However, there are some big differences between this outbreak of fighting and what the Israelis called Operation Cast Lead. Back in 2008-2009, Israel locked most of the global media out of its 23-day attack on Gaza. Not this time. Journalists have flooded into the war zone, giving the world a much better view of the bombardment, and some of the buildings that they work out of have been targeted. The social media side of the propaganda war has, of course, grown more sophisticated if not more civilized. And this is the first war on Gaza fought after the Arab Spring. So there are some new governments in the neighborhood and lots of new media outlets in those countries reporting on this story. Our starting point this week is Gaza and the coverage of a conflict that the Palestinians have since taken to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. I saw two rockets go, one actually from this direction, looked like one on the other side. What happens, they say, if this is a new wave of bus bombings in Israel? One of the challenges facing journalists covering any story in the Holy uh, Land yes, is, where do you start? It's going on now, so we're just How far back do you want to go? Whose Bible now, do you want to read? And in the case of Gaza, how much context do you want to provide about a place Israel has blockaded ever since 2006, one that Palestinians call the world's largest open-air prison? The main issue that is missing uh, is that they are dealing with this in, as a short-term uh, conflict, that who started firing missiles at each other and how do you stop it? Why are we seeing this escalation in violence now? We're seeing it in very short-term context and therefore that nuance, that critical element of the Palestinian narrative is not captured at all in the media, largely because the media and Western politicians have pretty much swallowed the Israeli line that Israel has a right to defend, defend itself. And what that means is by using this defense uh, terminology. Israel has the right, just like any other country, to defend itself. A language that not only comes out of uh, Israeli military leaders, politicians, but, uh, you know, Barack Obama's mouth as well. And so by focusing on this almost uh, absolute right uh, to defend themselves, they're able to control the message, uh, and Today, the American the media finds that a suitable and convenient terminology and adopts it. Israel says it is responding as any other country would. And that's the line that the international media, by and large, uh, has presented. And this is one reason why this conflict has not been resolved. And the diplomatic action that follows any kind of uh, military conflict never gets to the core issues and therefore never resolves the problem. This time, the diplomacy resulted in yet another ceasefire. So much in this story is reminiscent of the war on Gaza four years ago. The presence of the global media in the war zone is a big change, however, one that was probably forced on the Israelis by some of the new political realities that came out of the Arab Spring. In 2008-2009, uh, Mubarak was in power in Egypt, uh, so and he kept the border uh, with the Sinai at Rafah closed, uh, and the Israeli army kept the border at Erez closed. This time round, we have Mohamed Morsi in power in, in Egypt. They have kept Rafah uh, open, and the Israeli army, realizing that they couldn't keep the journalists out, have done an about face. They've actually sent out press releases saying, we'll do everything in our power to expedite things for you. We will provide soldiers to accompany you through the checkpoint. Uh, please coordinate with us. We can say Israel has learned from Kastled that not letting any journalists in does not 
astonishingly stopped the media from being interested in the situation. I think it's mostly a PR lesson. I think that also in the comparison to 2008, the operation has been much more limited. And I think that this is something that the Israeli government was uh, keen to show. And the only way for it to show it was to allow the media access. In 2008, the Israeli government said the media were being kept out of Gaza for their own protection. Not even Israeli journalists believed that one. This time, one of the testiest exchanges on the air involved Al Jazeera. It's very clear my answer. We don't target journalists, we target Hamas. And we have the channel to took the Israeli Prime Minister's Hamas. spokesman to task over an attack on a media building in Gaza in which eight Palestinian journalists were injured, including one who lost his leg. There were foreign journalists in that building. There were foreign journalists in buildings near to that building. None let of whom were hurt, sir. Let me remind None you. Whom... Let me remind you. So what None you of say... whom were hurt. So what are you saying? That a local Arab journalist's life is any less than an international journalist? You have buildings like this in every Arab capital with local news agencies, international ones and regional ones. And that was the case in Gaza. I don't know if the Israelis uh, were trying to silence the media or not. If they were, they're pretty stupid. And the Israelis are not stupid usually. I think they just hit it because they wanted to send a message that every building, every family, every spot in Gaza or in all of Palestine is a target. In, in this building, there's also the Hamas television station, uh, Al-Quds television. The Israeli army did hit that building. They say that they were only targeting that office. They identify Hamas, every aspect of Hamas, military and governmental and media, as being under the same rubric, a terrorist organization. And what's perhaps most troubling is that it really, you know, it insults the intelligence of anybody who has ever reported in a war zone or anybody who's familiar with the situation on the ground. Uh, striking the roof of a building from that far away, it's impossible to only strike the roof of a building. I mean, there are images that directly negate what Mark Regev was saying, and I think that interview, if anyone watches it, speaks for itself. Israel's media have also featured some fireworks. Channel 2 is state-owned, but like most Israeli news outlets, it does not shy away from sensitive issues. And when an Israeli military commentator suggested that killing more Palestinian civilians would weaken Hamas and therefore be in Israel's strategic interest, Ahmed Tibi, the leader of an Arab-Israeli party, went ballistic. It reflected that uh, some of the military correspondents in Israel are definitely, like military correspondents everywhere, I think, in the media, are very much taken with the army, and even some, some of them, without realizing it, can be way over-enthusiastic about the prospects of a military operation. And it almost makes it sound as if they're egging the military on. Ahmed Tibi, when he challenged the, the war correspondent in the studio, you could see that the um, anchor in the studio began to argue with him and to say, well, what about the Israeli civilians getting killed? <laughs> what about this? What about that? What about 12 years of rockets and so on and so forth? And the shouting match was very, very intense. 12 years of rockets. That is the Israeli context. 45 years under occupation or under siege. That is the Palestinian context. And when this new ceasefire ends and the fighting erupts again, we'll probably hear the same arguments. Because in the Holy Land, it's not just history that repeats itself, so do the sound bites. Our Global Village voices now on the coverage of the Israeli assault on Gaza. The minute the battles in Gaza started, an additional virtual battleground was created. Both sides are putting a lot of effort to fight over their narratives through social networks. I believe that it is important for them because they know that the way the conflict is perceived in the world will pretty much determine their ability to declare victory at the end of the fighting. The mainstream media have failed to report the truth on Gaza, but what's been important has been that uh, through social media, those of us around the world have been able to get the message out that there is an oppressor and there is an oppressed.
there is no battlefield on Twitter. The actual battlefield is happening on the ground where Palestinians are suffering. Twitter happens to be the tool that they use to tell their own side of the story, a side in which is often ignored or misrepresented by the mainstream media. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Pakistan is well known for being one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a journalist. It's also proving very dangerous to witness the murder of a journalist and to be prepared to testify. In January of last year, Wali Babur Khan, a reporter on GOTV, was shot and killed in Karachi. Khan had reported extensively on crime in that city. Six witnesses initially agreed to testify in the case. All of them are now dead murdered. The last of the six, Haider Ali, was shot and killed on November 11th. There are five people charged with the original murder and the case, despite the lack of witnesses, is proceeding and it's being heard within Karachi's central prison. At least 40 journalists have been killed, dozens more injured in Pakistan over the past 10 years. None of those cases, except the murder of an American journalist, Daniel Pearl, has resulted in a conviction. A journalist in Athens who thought he had won his legal case after publishing a long list of wealthy Greeks with Swiss bank accounts is going back to court. Magazine editor Kostas Vaxavanis published the so-called Lagarde List, 2,000 names of Greeks who were allegedly evading taxes during the country's financial crisis. Vaxavanis was acquitted on November 1st. However, court officials have declared that that verdict, quote, lacked credibility, unquote, and they've ordered a retrial. Vaxavanis accused the judiciary of trying to silence the Greek press. It's absolutely unprecedented, he said. The court has yet to even write up its decision finding me innocent, and the prosecutor's office is already ordering a retrial. When I was arrested, they not only ridiculed Greece internationally, trying to censor the press, when I am found innocent, they want to overturn the judgment. If found guilty, Vaxavanis could be jailed for up to two years. In Britain, two key former members of Rupert Murdoch's newspaper empire are facing fresh criminal charges, this time relating to the alleged bribery of police and public officials. Andy Coulson, the ex-editor of the now-defunct News of the World tabloid, who was also British Prime Minister David Cameron's director of communications, has been charged with illegally paying for information on the royal family. The paper's former royal correspondent, Clive Goodman, faces similar charges. Colson's ex-colleague at News International, Rebecca Brooks, has been charged over an alleged £100,000 worth of payments made to a Ministry of Defence official in exchange for news stories. In July of this year, Colson and Brooks were charged over phone hacking. Brooks has also been charged with perverting the course of justice in connection with the phone hacking investigation. All of the accused deny all of the charges. Police in London estimate the investigations triggered by the phone hacking scandal may last another three years. The force says it has 185 officers and civilian staff working on all of the related investigations. It has been a tumultuous couple of years in Indian politics, a challenging time for freedom of expression there. There was a test case earlier this month when two young women in Mumbai were arrested for Facebook posts that they put up following the death of a prominent politician. For a country that proudly calls itself the world's largest democracy, Indian institutions are proving to be pretty touchy over what gets said online. It's a media market of 1.2 billion people and the news industry there keeps growing. However, quantity and quality do not always go hand in hand. The journalism, certainly the televised version, has a very uniform look to it, regardless of what news channel you're tuning into. One person whose voice does stand out is Tarun Tejpal, the founder and editor of India's leading independent news and current affairs magazine, Tehelka. Tehelka is the Hindi word for sensation. Tarun Tejpal says his goal was to create a publication committed to constructive, crusading journalism, to counter the frivolity of the Indian mainstream news narrative and to hold power to account. It was inevitable the magazine would ruffle feathers, most of them political. The publication first came to prominence in early 2001, when its website exposed match-fixing in Indian cricket. Small gift for the New Year, New Year party. Later that year, it documented a culture of bribery at the Ministry of Defense, leading to the resignation of the defense minister. 
that journalistic sting operation almost led to Tehelka's downfall as well. After police raids and a lengthy judicial inquiry, the number of staff fell from 125 employees to just three. After more than two years of defending itself, Tehelka, with the help of India's cultural elite, was reborn as a weekly newspaper. Today, Tehelka's brand of journalism is attracting more and more readers, both in English and in Hindi. But how long can Tehelka last? After all, its own story reveals both the promise and the perils of muckraking journalism in modern India. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi sat down with Tarun Tejpal in London. Tarun Tejpal, welcome to The Listening Post. You know, the news business in India is booming. Um, on TV alone, there are nearly 100 news channels broadcast in all of the 13 languages. So when you do go back to India and when you're flipping through the channels, what is your assessment of the journalism that's on offer to Indians today? Well, it's both good and bad. The bad part really is that it's all much too much the same. So the curious thing is that while the number of media outlets are multiplied, the focus of their concerns has narrowed. The problem with that loud sameness is that it drowns out the complexities of India. On the good side, the, the amount of media focus that we have today is, 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 is constantly putting questions to power. The media pressure on, on big issues is, is constant. All in all, I'm definitely for the fluorescence of media, for the multiplicity of media, because I think India's greatest prophylactic against oppressive regimes of any kind is really the multiplicity of media. But there will be good and bad, but hopefully they keep cancelling each other out. As a journalist, as a media entrepreneur, how difficult do you find it to stay away from the, the two kind of themes that seem to dominate so much of Indian television, at least, which is Bollywood and cricket? Indians love spectacle. We love the tamasha. You know, we love Bollywood is tamasha for us. Cricket is tamasha for us. Life is a bit of a tamasha for us. So inevitably, even news has become a bit of a tamasha. I think it's 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 disappointing. Telka steers clear of them largely. Our concerns are really the big issues of inequality, injustice, human rights violations. I mean, but that is Telka's mandate. You have to understand that in a country of a billion, two hundred million people, even if I sold a million copies of Telka, it would be a drop in the ocean. But if I can inflect policy, if I I can get one minister to make a judgment call which is beneficial, that impacts tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. I think anyone in an editorial position in India today needs to understand the framework of our challenges, which are huge. And if you understand the framework of those challenges, then you know where you should put your resource, both human and financial, and the work you need to do. Often, I think we don't do it. Earlier this year, we interviewed an online political cartoonist, Asim Trivedi. And he told us that his website, Cartoons Against Corruption, had been pulled offline by political operatives who didn't like what he was doing. And then in September, we saw Asim Trivedi being arrested in Mumbai on charges of sedition. You know, this is the latest in a series of increasingly more aggressive moves by the Indian government to clamp down on online content. What's happening here? Can you explain what's motivating it? This is very much part and parcel of a kind of very fractious landscape that India is becoming. There will be battles of this kind all the time. Uh, the tragedy is that it's not actually cohering with the founding vision of India. You know, Nehru, even in 1951, had advocated the abolition of sedition laws. And in fact, when I met the Minister for Information and Broadcasting the very night that Asim Trivedi was arrested, is the first thing I told her. The good news is the very next day he was bailed out. So good sense had prevailed. I just think it's a kind of uh, a time in India where media will be negotiating a minefield. And that's OK, because India is a bit of a minefield right now. At a media forum in Goa last year, you said that the problem with Indian media is that the news you get, the journalism you get, is not paid for by you. So who is paying for Indian journalism? And why do you think they're the problem? All across the world, readers in free societies do not want to pay for the journalism. And journalism costs. Good people cost. We sometimes pursue stories for six, six months and come up with nothing. All these things cost a lot of money. Somebody has to pay for it. Every single week, every single month is is a tightrope walk at the Hilka. 50% of my life goes in looking for resources and investment to keep the work going. So I, I go and seduce very rich men with the idea of doing a journalism that's actually antithetical to them, you know? And uh, the, the good news is that obviously it can be done since we are still around eight years later. Uh, but it's a tough call, it weighs you down. Uh, the, the only future I see in free societies of, of high quality journalism that does not owe its existence to corporations is the setting up of trusts and collectives 
which have been funded and allow journalists a free work. If we, if we deem journalism to be core to the survival of free societies, then we've got to figure a mechanism by which we can free them up from this very obvious commercial control. In India, you will see hundreds of political expose every year, but you won't find one good corporate expose ever, because at the end of the day, that's the hand that feeds you. You don't bite it. One of the biggest scandals to hit um, India's media in recent times was the leak of these recorded conversations between prominent Indian journalists and a lobbyist, Neera Radia. Now, on the tapes, we heard journalists agreeing to pass messages between political parties. We heard one of them arranging a kind of set-up interview with uh, a CEO. What do you make of the conversations you heard on that? What does it tell you about the state of Indian media? I I'm actually pretty conflicted about that. I, I like the fallout of that, that the it's led to a process of inquiry and cleaning up. But I'm very conflicted about private uh, conversations being so easily made public without all the context being in place. I mean, and you have to remember that journalists don't exist in isolation. They're not sort of, you know, sort of Avengers out of, uh, you know, hell or something who exist in complete isolation. At the end of the day, you're very much embedded into the same ecosystem that you write and report about. If you're part of that ecosystem, you are going to both feed off that ecosystem and speak the language of that ecosystem. What, what you put out officially, finally, on a piece of paper or on television is really your true testimonial. And that's what you've got to be judged by. Everyone has an opinion on the media. And, and in India, the media is almost as much the news uh, as the news is. What do you think Indian media is missing today? My complaint against most, most media and people running media is that they don't even understand what the true story of, of India is today. It, it's taken us years with some of the big narratives that Telka has fought for. For example, the Maoist narrative in, in central India, where we had reporters on the ground for years, and still continue to do, to begin to even get that information out so that other media could begin to feed off it and, and respond to it and amplify it. Uh, similarly with the Muslim issue, you know, it took us years of hard work to actually bring to the fore the obvious prejudices that existed in the system against Muslims. This is the stuff that in people who guide Indian media and helm Indian media need to know that this is a country that actually needs fabulously illuminating journalism to bring across stories that are being buried, because they will not be buried, they will actually all erupt as a million mutinies, which is what is happening in India today. You have trouble all across the board. You know, and, and a lot of that does not get reflected in an intelligent way by Indian media. Well, Tarun, thank you so much. And thanks for speaking to the Listening Post. Pleasure to be here. Finally, remember Kony 2012, that online NGO video that broke viral records earlier this year? It got all kinds of attention, a good deal of praise, but also some criticism for its cliched portrayal of Africans as helpless and completely dependent on Western and foreign aid. Well, here's a video that turns that cliché on its head. It's produced by a group of Norwegian students and academics. It's a charity single in which Africans are asked to donate generously and provide relief to the desperate people of Norway. Africa for Norway is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. I'm basically heading up a team that's getting Africans together in this time of need for Norway, you know, helping them out. A lot of people aren't aware of what's going on there right now. It's kind of just as bad as poverty, if you ask me. Sunlight puts smiles on people's faces. People don't ignore starving people, so why should we ignore cold people? Frostbite kills too.